Welcome back to the WGLE, you guys. I know it's been quite the break, but we are here and we're ready to bring you all the action. So I think it's obviously best to start from the top. I mean, Kazza Crew, the best start of the season, I think we can safely say they've ever had. Um, a fantastic run, of course, they only lost against uh, Tornado. So yeah, really good for them. And Wombat on Tanks are going to take this fight. Look at that damage coming in. Hilf has found Kusoko, so it's not a clean one this time, but already the damage is going to start piling up. Now, Synergy, of course, do have that time where they become mildly redundant, but still, so far, Wombat on Tanks are starting to dwindle. Breakneck is down to nothing. Coca-Cola really clinging on for Deer Knife. Nice little pick up by Dreamlike then, just using that bat chat to the best of its capability. It's going to get taken down now. Wombat's, you know, they're not particularly far ahead in terms of hit points. I mean, you can see both teams pretty much have the same. Um, but, uh, you know, I, they have the hill now. They can start to lock Synergy down. You know, they really can't move Synergy at this point in time. John into the 1v1. Dreamlike has the shell. And this should be over and done with Kusong staring down the barrel of defeat. And it will be Synergy. Only Vorsig in the T110 and the Armageddon there in the STB1 to try and pick off four tanks of Utopia. All pretty healthy, you know, two, three, four shots. It's going to be a mountain of a task to do and probably a little bit impossible as Utopia will just start getting their way out of that magic forest and pushing him for the kill. Yeah, and Armageddon knows his days are numbered now. He's going to have to go out, just chase him down, waiting for the perfect shot. He does need to rush it. He takes it on the fly. And now Vorsin is just the last man standing. He knows that it's a matter of time in this one. Four tanks closing in. Will's going to close it down. That's 750 damage per shot. One and a half thousand damage that should have been done, and Diodor's not making the same mistake. Well, Vorsic, though, didn't land his shot. Now, it does buy more time. That's what you've got to keep in mind here. It's not just about these kills, it's about timing. 50 seconds left. Now, Vorsic, shell just didn't connect. Muka is still buying time. He's being a pest. He's being a nuisance. He can just sit in. But money on the cover, though, takes down Diodor. Now, Muka still waiting for a shell. Look at the fire coming in from the back lines. Vorsic does find Muka, but this is almost over. Lucique is having his way with them. Everywhere he goes, literally being bullied and broken from court corner to corner as when money gets run over by FC Dynamo and the mouse is certainly not going to scurry anywhere at this rate as Desha just has to stare down those turrets just picking them apart one by one too many angles to cover up by himself and the mouse sure it could have saved the life it has sustained but by this point it has so much to do well, make it three there as does even though he does back away here he was the guy right at the forefront now dead zone should be able to pick up duck of death now, the next SV1 is on the chopping board. This is going from bad to worse. Grosser can do nothing in the back lines and they know it. But that is going to be more than enough reset here. Where is the backup plan from Moose? They've got to have such great fire, great control. Invictus takes a bit of a beating here. Durs does as well, but no real focus fire coming out from Oops means that Invictus is now in trouble. He's going to have the freedom to be taken down by the likes of Durs. And look at it. He's down to a one shot here. Raging Potato is going to pick that one up real nice and easy. And no one there to cover him off. And one by one, piece by piece, Penta are pulling ahead in this. Yeah, they're just going to push all in. I mean, they saw they have the advantage, okay? They've only taken down an RU25, but one, but they want to go and uh, do a little bit more damage. To be honest, they've received quite a lot, but as soon as they get into the close, close proximity, it'll be a different game. Oh, I don't so, know, man. Uh, what? Okay, Ooh. does suddenly got down Fussy Eater, and <clears throat> it's not going too well, to be fair. Mel and finds Genghis, and this is sloppy. Oops, I, do not throw this game right now. New Moltre found Grosser. What the hell just happened? But the cap is continuing. Ten seconds left. They have to traverse so much space. You can see the guys huddling together, trying to find the best angle to deny this. And with mere seconds left, someone would have to make an outstanding play to get back in time. And Oops, win it out in the last couple of seconds. Just about out by a whisker. Rather dismal performance in their first real display after the break. You'll have to tune in on Thursday. So guys, hopefully see you then. Some absolutely stellar games to start us off uh, for this year, of course. Some, some interesting uh, conclusions to those games as well. Penta going all in, receiving the push from Oops, and Oops finally winning out the final seconds. And what does Oliver say? Unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, I, I know, I know, I know. But uh, it was one of those moments where I was actually genuinely shocked, you know. I thought Penta at the beginning, they looked so strong. And um, they just ended up throwing it. And I think, you know, Tuesday was a game of uh, a match day of throws that we had... So many interesting results. I mean, Synergy getting uh, getting a good win over Wombats on tanks. 
the team that came first in season one. And we did speculate there, of course, uh, it's some of their games, some of their time was actually spent on the WCA tournament, not really having chance to practice for 768. I mean, Rock's Utopia, Utopia were three nil ahead at the beginning and then threw, I think, uh, four rounds in a row and gave it to Rocks. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that was just terrible. Three one ahead even. So I really thought some individual issues for some players caused that um, that problem. Some tactical misplay, especially on Ruhrenberg, made it really bad. And yeah, Oops, Penta again. Penta looked so strong at the beginning. And then Oops just uh, really dug their, their heels in and showed that, yeah, OK, we're a new team, but we do have the ability to uh, come back for, I think, the second time this season. Well, there's your results from Tuesday anyway. We can have a look and see how that really affected our standings here this season as well. Because still, it is still taking shape, of course, as we do look towards that ladder. Casa Cruz sit up the top, sitting fairly pretty, of course, with a bit of a blemish uh, just before the break. They're losing to Tornado Rocks. But, you know, our usual suspects, Tornado Rocks, now climbing their way towards the top. Wombats and Tanks still sitting sort of towards the middle. They haven't played that many games. So many games, should I say. Only actually got uh, three, I think, is the actual number. They got a tiebreaker win in on Tuesday. So, you know, Utopia, again, the same tendencies displayed as of last season. Mm -hmm. Able to take down the lower teams, able to show potential to beat the top teams, and as you said, really capitulated there to Tornado Rocks in the later stages of their match there as well. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I mean, they came so close to beating Tornado. And, you know, I kind of think that Tornado is pretty weak right now. If any of these new teams want to come and beat them, I think, you know, KB, Oops, something like that, um, they could. But, uh, I mean, Tornado, when they just turn into overdrive, do come into their own and are a little bit of a different beast. Um, obviously, Synergy has three more points there, but uh, the website's currently a bit broken, so that wasn't updated. But it doesn't really make that much of a difference to the standings. Um, they'll be on eight points, so they'll be sitting around sixth place. Um, but yeah, today it's a whole different game. Of course, you know, the Wombats having so little games in that first part of the season, we'll be getting to see them today and uh, next week as well. That's right. So we all have seen a few teams, their position drastically changes when they have to play a bunch of games in a very short amount of time. And of course, today's matches, as you sort of alluded to, Oliver, we do have some nice ones being thrown in the mix as well. Of course, we'll be kicking off with another Polish Derby here, Rusty Roster and out of range. Yeah, we get a lot of Polish teams this season, so we're going to be getting to see them um, up against each other quite a few times. And uh, yeah, Rusty Roster, I mean, they, they had a pretty good run against Strong Siema. Um, they lost against Utopia, but yeah, they have a good chance against Out of Range. And uh, Rusty is coming off a loss and so is Out of Range. Um, but that was a tiebreaker loss to KB for Rusty, so I guess they, they're looking okay. Sinji Penta, yeah, Pen Sinji had that, that win yesterday against Wombat, so I guess that's uh, them on a high, and Penta had the loss, so I'm not sure. But I think Penta just really needs to start getting some good results, because otherwise he's going to sit pretty quick. And for Wombats, I mean, considering yesterday's performances and how well KB has played the season, that's going to be a tricky game for them. Some interesting ones here as well, and we want to see really where these teams start to sit themselves come week eight, week nine, going in towards those playoffs. People obviously getting their seeds for those playoffs. Some teams won't even make it into the playoffs in the first place as well. And we saw Penta last season sneak their way in there and actually have a, mm. a, I guess, breakout performance at our season one final. So these things are always possible. But again, like you said, Penta languishing in a similar way that they did last season, struggling with some of those, I don't know, fifth through 12th place teams, losing games that they maybe ostensibly shouldn't, but we know that they're the kind of team that can make that little run towards the top, towards the end. So, uh, obviously, those are our two games for today. It's Rusty Roster versus Out of Range to be starting things off here, Melly. Votes are open, I'm sure, as people will be interested to see where the voting is going to be shifting between these two. Absolutely. And I went on Corman's Facebook page searching for that match prediction from his side but I couldn't found, uh, find any. Maybe he'll pick that back up uh, this year, but currently the voting is heavily favored for out of, uh, not for out of range, I'm sorry, for um, Rusty Rasta with 75%. I mean, Oliver, I'll, I'll defer to you on this one. Um, you know, we've actually seen out of range have some pretty dismal results so mm. far this season. Definitely not what they would have hoped being the top seed out of the Silver Series. Rusty Roster looking comparably better. I mean, they came quite close to KB, of course, in that little tiebreaker there. And, you know, despite on having, I think, the one win to their name, they're still showing some promise. Yeah, I think for, for, for out of range, the biggest problems they have is that they haven't got any points since that first matchup. Yep. So, well, it's Rusty Roster, you know, they're having a great season either so far. But it's not like they just started well and went downhill. They've been getting results here, there, everywhere, kind of uh, showing some potential, getting some points. So for out of range, they're on the down and down, and Rusty Ross are kind of, you know, peaking. So 
Is it one of those peaks today? I don't know. And uh, out of range, I think they need to be getting the next four wins, five, six wins in a row if they really want to have a chance of going to those playoffs. Yep. So there you have it, Melly. That's uh, probably exactly why some people are putting their money or their points, I guess, behind that Rusty Russell. be still, since the vote is still open. So head over to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash WGLU, and get involved. The vote will run throughout the first four rounds therefore two maps of the game and of course you can win bonus codes by predicting the exact scoreline as one of the first three correct predictors mm -hmm. So as usual, of course, uh, you're <clears throat> not only rewarded for getting the right answer, but also getting your predictions in as early as possible as well. That person that predicts a correct result earlier on in the piece, of course, it's more of a risk to take, but mm. your odds are winning just a little bit higher. So, I mean, what we do have, which is quite nice actually for these games, is we got to sit down with some of these team captains and actually see how they thought they'd fare here. Um, we didn't get to see Carmen's prediction on Facebook, but we can definitely get a bit of a word from him about how he thought out of range we're going to perform in this particular matchup. Let's have a look. Rusty Raster, other Polish team, is a very hard opponent for us because they know as well and we know them well. And the question is, who will play a better game on this day? I think the score with like 5-3 or 5-4 is very possible, but I hope we will be on the top. I think it will all depend who will play better on, this, on, his, on tanks. Me and my crew or Bashista and his guys? I think it will be a very tough and very interesting game for you to watch. You never know, though. 50-50, Carmen. Yeah, I mean, this is the same thing. I was going to say, you never know, though, if he's taking the piss or not, because he never looks into the camera. Yeah. You know, so he's always like looking at the, around the camera. Imagine if we cast it like this. Welcome back on to the, the WGL. Yeah. It's like looking at camera in some other part of the studio. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it's not the wrong camera. It's just something we're more interested in watching a fly on the wall or something. So that's it, what Carmen reckons. Look, I mean, he's always been the king of neutrality, right? He may as well be Swiss <laughs> with what he's saying here. He's like, it's got to be a close one. It's yeah. all about who plays well on their day. This is the, the general adage that you do get. But at least he uh, elongates that one uh, idea into at least 20 seconds of conversation yeah. here. But, I mean, as you said, it's between him and his crew and Basista and the rest of Rusty Roster. So let's see what the other Polish team had to say about this match. Uh, we think out of range is a really strong Polish team and we hope we can beat them in a really exciting match. And uh, it's a Polish derby, so we want to show our viewers that we are the best Polish team. Well, there you have it. Uh, again, not a heck of a lot being said there <laughs> as well. You'd think these two teams that actually know each other fairly well, having yeah. played through the Silver Series and such, but Basista, again, fairly tight-lipped about maybe what he thought about this match. Yeah, I mean, that's how it goes. I think if if you're more used to being in front of camera and everything like that, you can definitely express yourself a little bit better, although we're not really the greatest examples no. for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, he said, you know, one interesting thing, it's a Polish derby. It's something we re reiter reiterate a lot. And, um, you know, there's a big Polish community, there's a big Polish rivalry. I mean, back in when I was playing all those eons ago on a, on a high level, there was, you know, what one pad, one SPP, Savisha, uh, one, what, uh, one SPP as a clan, pirates with a lot of Polish players. Like, there's all these Polish teams and there was a big rivalry there. So I think that still exists in, in seven, uh, 768 at least and in other parts of World of Tanks community as well. So it's great. One SB, SBP, Zavisha has been around for ages. Remember them like first way, First way? go for it winner. Yep, yeah. exactly. Bring in back the memories here as well. So, and the reason why we bring this up as well, because the play style sometimes is quite striking. It's mm. almost as if they got together and made some sort of tacit agreement about how they were going to play tanks. And, you know, interestingly enough here, first map shouldn't surprise any of you guys if you're aware of what our Polish teams usually go for. It's Ghost Town. We're going to be kicking off at Ghost Town, which has always been a draw card for quite a few of these teams here. They like to go for that one. Um, they're confident on it here as well. Mm. I mean, we've seen um, it change a little bit now, of course, as, as the formats change, uh, being brought in as well, and as teams are learning and learning how to sort of play that one here. I mean, I don't know. Out of range, haven't given us many results to speak of. In the, in the games that they've lost, 
they lost them quite badly. They weren't really that close. So whereas conversely, Rusty Roster in their losses have had some fairly close games in the mix here as well. So I mean, I'd have to agree with a lot of our voters at home. I personally feel like Rusty Roster is looking good for this one. Um, yep. Just purely in terms of this one going up against out of range, I feel like they have the edge. Yeah, I mean, out of range, their last result was 5-0 against Utopia. Like, you know, that's the kind of thing we're looking at. We saw that first round and we were just like, oh, this is going to be horrible. And he went downhill real quick. Yep. Um, they got absolutely trounced by that other Polish team. And um, yeah, I mean, Utopia is a great team, but I think out of range coming first in Silver Series, having such a good run there, like, you know, a lot of people expect them to provide some uh, higher quality in uh, the season two at 768. But, you know, that was 754, and I guess it's a whole different ball game these days. Um, but we are pretty much ready. As you mentioned, Ghost Town's the first map, um, a map we've been seeing fairly consistently, not as much as Mines or Prokhorovka, but it seems like these teams seem to like Ghost Town and Himmelsdorf as a kind of city esque maps. And uh, it's been pretty interesting, um, you know, a lot of heavy tanks, a lot of, uh, but bit, I would say a lot of heavy tanks, but more dynamic play than we get to see in Himmelsdorf. Yeah, and I mean, Ghost Town as well, uh, for neither of these teams has been overly imp impressive results, actually, if I, if I do look sort of back over our stats here. I mean, I think out of range, I've only played it maybe four times, and I think they actually haven't won at, at all. Yeah. Right? So, pff, straight up. They play three rounds on attack. Against and Utopia, one like, they got trounced, you know, for instance. Yeah, so, I mean, this is not exactly a draw card for out of range, but we'll have to see if they brought something a little bit different to the table, and it's Rusty Roster, who, you know, ostensibly should be sitting a little bit more comfortable going on into this one as well. But I, have to, I do have to say... Um, only three wins, only three round wins for Rusty Roster on this map. They've all been on the attacking side. Zero defense wins to speak of. Well, then they should have a theoretically good round here because they're on the attacking side. As we do go into this match, of course, 768. Um, only one round per, per side in case you're just joining us as a new viewer. And uh, looking at the lineups quickly, I mean, very heavy from both teams as we'd expect. We get to see that TVP in action once again, played by out of range. And as uh, we've seen quite a few times as well, including on Tuesday, an M40, M43 is, uh, well, pretty close proximity as well, these two teams at the beginning. Rusty Roster not really going too far outside their cap. Um, I feel like they've been kind of uh, stopped in their tracks literally by out of range as they've been quite aggressive down to the south. Yeah, so normally we often see teams set up in the north and the south and clash over that central point, but out of range actually going to take that advantage away from them and force Rusty Roster to fight tooth and nail to even get towards the middle part of the map. Senti's been spotted here on the 215B, and Formula 1 is just lurking around that corner as well with the Rough Trugger E100, which, of course, is going to be doing a lot of damage. If you can get the shots off, that is no damage. Oh, there's a first shot going in. It actually was towards Doric, and it's a big hit into him. Taking Artillery quite sure. low there. Dezek, yep, making his presence known from the back. Yeah, that was a great shot. I mean, that's the perfect position for him. Very straight roads. I like how Rust uh, out of range have Ooh. kind of put them in that awkward position, but that Waffentrager does so much. Yeah, Formula One though, getting punished for sort of poking his head out of cover there as well. Figo is going to send him packing down to the one shot as well. 1996 damage taken off him in such a short space of time. That's what you do towards that Waffentrager. You get him off the map, and Lividus has done just that. Milos trying to respond with a little bit of damage back in towards him here. That's the only one casualty so far, but out of range are doing okay in terms of those health points. The down one gun until Lifidus drops as well. So that's a 50B off the map. You can see these FE215Bs are always going head to head. Prosto very low in the back. And back now towards that southwestern corner. It's Milos and Piotr now trying to make a bit of a counter push here. But Basista and Prosto want around the corner. Senti and Rissiak have to stay alive for the moment. They can't get any help from Milos. He's too high up, doesn't have the depression, and it's a 3v2 situation. Doric will go belting around the corner as well. He's looking quite healthy and out of range. Might be getting slightly outmaneuvered here, but they still have that lead. Yeah, but I would say, you know, Rusty Roster, they are together, but they're just too low on HP. So they're going to get maybe Senti out here, but the rest of the team is going to come in. Kirilov is going to come off reload. And Milos is easy going to be able to dispatch of Polswed. And Senti does fluff that last shot, though. Now he's going quite low now, just down to the one, and Doric will look for the finish. Here, Senti, though, had the shot just in time to clean up the IS-7. Punching around the corner, wasn't able to get his shot off before getting taken down. There's only two tanks left here for the Rusty roster, and the Christmas break might have done just that. A little bit of oxidization in the joints there, a little bit slow, and a little bit rusty. It is out of range, of course, to get that one. Their first win for the whole season of any round on this particular map there, and they've done it in style. Yeah, great stuff. I, I mean, just from the beginning, we saw them being super aggressive down south. Um, Rusty Roster spotted them, but uh, I mean, they couldn't go anywhere. They were just stuck around the corners, um, uh, but they held on very well and um, pushing forwards, getting good damage out of those Waffen Tragers. Okay, he did five out of six shots, but I mean, that's still 
3,800 damage done. You can't really yeah. ask for more than that. It's almost two tier 10 tanks. Um, and the FV215Bs had a bit of a field, field day against the T110s. Great DPM, easily managed to take them down. Much better hit, hit points, not too many bounces. And yeah, I mean, I just really liked the way that they managed to deal with it. They knew that they, knew they had the advantage and they pushed it at the end with some great coordination as well. So, I mean, we saw Formula 1 being focused down fairly early on the piece here as well, which is what you generally want to do towards the Waffentrager. He still did 1,600 points of damage, though, and definitely made his presence known. But the TVP mm. now you know, heading up towards the top of the scoreboard. We're seeing the strength of this tank. 2,800 damage there for Cormac Keroff. Very, very strong from him. Three kills, of course, on the cleanup crew. <clears throat> I mean, we saw a lot of chaotic camera switching in that match because there was fights happening on two key fronts here. On the yep. east and west of that city is where these fights were happening now. And, I mean, like you sort of uh, tied it up fairly well, I feel like we saw that out of range sustained well through that damage. And bear in mind, of course, it was Desic was in an artillery, so he wasn't even able to, able to be involved in those fights. And he still obviously definitely justified his position there as well. We saw one shot come in from him. He got a couple more, in fact, with about 2,200 damage. So very, very solid from him as well. And Carmen's got to be happy with that, and so should the rest of his boys. Yeah, I mean, you can't really ask for more than that. Uh, the M40, M43 is always a bit of a, a joker. You don't really know how it's going to play out for sure. you. But it's a pretty small map and um, it's pretty straight line. So as you saw how, how out of range played it. They they basically boxed in Rusty Roster. They knew where they wanted to play them. They kept them in those alleys and uh, there's pretty straight line shots for for Desic. So yeah, great stuff. Really good first round. I mean, completely black and blue, uh, black and white compared to what we've seen from them in uh, in previous match days. So it looks good right now for out of range. Um, as we said, they they do need to start picking up these results. Um, and Rusty so far has been the better Polish team, I hate to say it. And uh, now on the defensive side, slightly easier on Ghost Town, but it's a pretty symmetrical map, so... Um can't really say it's it's any easier, I guess, in some ways. Yeah, it's funny. Positionally speaking, uh, you can't all, you can't give an inherent advantage to either team on this map. It's no. actually about how how you set up is still very very important. We talked about this back in 7:42, actually, whereas uh, you know you could have made your mistake in the first three seconds, and that would be game over. Here, maybe we like to think it's a little bit more forgiving, and especially an extra element of chaos thrown in there with the tier tens being present and doing so much damage, and you know having such a capacity for uh, for, for causing absolute mayhem. Mm. But still, those first few moves are important. You can maneuver around it here. We saw where Rusty Roster chose to take their fights. Seemed like at some points they were out maneuvering, but really it came down to out of range, sustaining through the damage. Began to return plenty of their own as well. And you saw a couple times, you know, two low health tanks. One goes around the corner and was one of the out of range tanks, picked him up before he could go down. Little things like that. The longer you stay alive, of course, the more help you can be to your team and the more damage you can put across the line. Kind of obvious, I like to think. But here's our tank picks anyway for this one. Double Conqueror for out of range here, going for that mm. uh, very heavy sort of uh, core with those tier nines. Yeah, I mean, super heavy. I mean, you basically got five out of seven tanks, which have a lot of HP with decent DPM. Obviously, FE215B is a DPM beast. But then you have that nice little uh, balance there with the two AMX50Bs with the super burst, um, which can really just pump down some of those tanks very, very well. So I like that lineup. We've got Shojek in the Dozid 111 and, uh, well, 1111 slash 4. <laughs> uh, but that's a bit of a mouthful, I have to say it. We haven't seen that this season so far and uh, could be used effectively. Really good armor, really good side armor, great on side scraping. Along with that T54, those are the two interesting picks for the uh, RR team. Let's keep an eye on those and let's see how they sort of factor into things here. Uh, if there's a real reason behind it, we'll know pretty soon now. It's Prosto. He's the man just looking towards the north here, and he actually wasn't ready for some of the damage coming towards him. He's forced to turn his tank around and try and maybe angle it a little bit better because it's a very, very early push from out of range to the cap. Yeah, they just want to be aggressive. I think they, they looked to their previous games and thought, well, you know, we just weren't willing to go forwards. We're being too passive. We're not doing th something which the other team doesn't expect. Maybe that's what we're doing in Silver Series. That's maybe we're, why we were winning. So yeah, putting two tier nines in the, in the cap along with the FE215B further back so it can actually reverse out of there if it does go uh, badly for them. And they're taking a lot of damage here on the early stages. Sure, they've got three on the cap and sure it's ticking down quickly, but you will notice that Polsved is on the flank in that T54. He can really harass here and make it hard for this cap to be completed. There's yet another reset coming in. It is quickly, of course, back down towards 10 seconds. Three tanks on that cap makes a lot of difference here, but the rest of out of range, they need to do enough damage to keep Rusty Roster from getting confident enough to push on towards that cap. And that is not the case here. Rusty Roster seemed pretty comfortable jockeying back and forth, putting shot after shot in. And you can see Piotr, he took a shot in from 
Pulse with now. So out of range, surrounded inside that middle cap. Look at all the red on that minimap. Rusty Ross to have this canvas out nicely, and now it's going to devolve in just a straight shooting gallery. I mean, Curla for Formula 1 did a little bit of a bad job there against Figo and Doric. I mean, they took a lot of damage and uh, didn't really make that flank pay off for them. Uh, it's still in the, it's still a game on, to be honest. I mean, Rusty Ross is not that far ahead. Um, but they are starting to exchange well. The two T110s and the, the very heavy hitting I7 is pushing forwards. That's right. And Piotr is going to be the only man to really deal with that one there as well. Senti tried to help out. A shot towards Figo. He didn't miss it. Oh, he didn't connect it, sorry. And Lefidus was there to pick him up. And there's two kills going very, very quickly. Out of range. We're looking all right there. They have the tanks and now only four. Most of them one shots as well. It's just Formula 1 to be able to soak up the damage. And he's going to try and do just that right now. But he's taken already half of his health in damage just poking around that corner. He wants a piece of Lefidus. He's not sure if he's on reload or not here. And this is really important. Lifidus just wants to simulate uh, that he does have shots ready to go, but it looks like he's going to be caught away from this anyway. It's getting close. 1,700 to 1,300 odd points. Formula 1 can get the finish, but look at him. He's scared to poke this corner. He's scared of the backup, and he is scared that Lifidus might have shots. He could have had him off the map by now. Well, he definitely uh, slowed the game down. Formula oh. 1 misses that shot. I mean, not good at all, and he's going to oh, fluff the second God. one. What is this? God help me, I don't know. Well, out of range, you're going to lose it there at the last few seconds. Looking fairly good after a very aggressive push forward there. But of course, that one issue that we saw in those last few moments was just one of a comedy of errors there for out of range that unfortunately allowed them to lose the map. Yeah, I felt like um, they, they didn't play very well as a team. I mean, we didn't see that much damage from the Conquerors. Um, and then we had the 250Bs flanking around. Uh, but even though the other team was pushing forward, trying to get in tile down positions with the T110s and the Amex 50Bs, the flanking 50Bs who had the first shot seemed to do less damage. I mean, one of them received 1.7k, 1.8k. You can see the moment here. Like, Figo should be going down really quickly, or Lifeters. But you see, like, immediately 1.7, 1.8k almost. And, you know, 1.5 going towards Figo, even though they had the first shot. That's never a good thing. They don't find one of those tier 10 tanks. And uh, I think that really just uh, puts a nail in the coffin. You can already see they're not trading particularly well. No, and that was uh, kind of what got out of range for their first round actually so well was they did trade quite effectively. They decided to fight. They were aggressive as they were in that last mm. round, of course. But the, the, things just seemed to go better for them. It was less of a dice roll and more of them you know, trading that damage fairly well. We did see, of course, in this map that a lot of those out-of-range tanks were pretty low on health, but all of them were. So that's actually a good sign. It means that they're sharing out health uh, fairly evenly. But when the when the armoured fist, I'm going to say, of, of uh, Rusty Roster comes pushing through and they have a 110E5, an IS-7, and a, uh, I reckon it's an FE215B, all healthy, not a good sign when they're pushing together as well. That's a cleanup crew. You don't want. That's not. not that's not a janitor just sweeping the no, floor. That's like not. the trash compactor really taking out the trash here. But here's your stats, of course. And Lifford is uh, sitting pretty up the top there as well. He got three kills, by the way, and 3,700 damage. Pretty impressive. Yeah, he was the guy who just uh, peaked the corner just after Figo, and he he got some great damage back. Uh, two clips and managed to stay alive at the end behind that building. So a yeah, very static position from him, but he played it very well. And uh, it's pretty funny. I mean, most of the players on that front page are, are, are out of range players, but yes. the standouts were Rusty Roster. And there's obviously is your, uh, your bottom end of that list there as well. I mean, everyone doing decent amount of damage. We do have some games where some tanks do no damage or one shot, but, you know, even Rissi able to take five shots there as well and do a fair bit of damage, of course. And that Conqueror, not easily the uh, heaviest hitting tank on the battlefield at tier nine, but still definitely doing some work there. So, you know, if you're out of range, you shouldn't be too disheartened by this one as well, because you've seen fairly consistent damage going across your team. Yep. The fact that Lifidus gets to output almost 4k damage is maybe a little bit concerning in itself. It's an extra uh, an extra 1400 on top of any other tank on the other team. So that's almost a whole other tank in itself. And when you've got that one player that is able to have the freedom to not only fire all those shots, but reload twice and yep. still do all that much damage, you've got to be concerned. Those, yeah, those 50Bs need be to be problem. prioritized. Yeah, I mean the 50Bs need to go down and I feel like he was a player who didn't necessarily have to do that much, uh, that much damage. I felt he was kind of left alone to do his own kind of thing, which in a 50B, when you only have 24 seconds reload, um, it can go very badly. I mean, 1.6K for every 24 seconds, yep. it, you know, it, it does add up very, very quickly. But anyway, on to our next map, which is going to be the uh, the beautiful Mines. Um, interesting lineups. I mean, TVPs, we already talked about that, pretty going to be uh, heavy featurely on this one. M40, M43 as well. But I mean, three FE215Bs on the attack from Rusty Ross. That's, that's uh, it's almost unprecedented. Interesting indeed. Oh, yeah, out of range, I mean, yeah, of course. It's um, out of range. So. You'll have to see, though. I mean, you know, fairly durable, from, especially from the front and the turret. 
Can I able to output a fair bit of damage? I mean, it's a fast-firing team. You combine it with the TVPs, and you have a lot of DPM really coming down, or at least, you know, damage in a pinch, should I say. Never persist to take a little bit more than he would have liked there. Poking up in that STB1. And we've got the 430 Mark II here for Socek as well. So, interesting tank to really put in towards the front lines here. You have to wonder why. I mean, normally we see teams maybe keep a tank like that back towards that K4, K5 area. But he's opted to come forward. And Desek again, just making his presence known, slapping the face of his sister there with a well-aimed artillery shell. And the Rusty Roster captain take it low, forced to back away from this fight here. His Doric as well. A little bit of damage in towards him. And Rusty Roster looking worse for wear after the first few seconds here. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Persista was pretty aggressive there, the team captain. Uh, he kind of got away pretty uh, pretty easy, though. I mean, to be honest, he, he bounced two or three shells from the TVPs. That's a combination of the, the bad penetration and the heat ammo. But then Desek was there to pick up the pieces, and now he's pretty much a one-shot. And Sojek in the 430, too. Um, you know, not as good as a T-54, but the teams like to pick it because of the armor. Also got punished quite heavily, and, you know, this right now, Considering all the other rounds we've seen out of range on mines, which is just going aggressive, pushing over across the hill, kind of going this YOLO style, is a lot better. They're peaking, they're winning the exchanges effectively. Yeah, very, very measured approach from them here. Like you said, not something we're used to seeing, but now the damage really started to come out. The floodgates are opening, and Rusty Ross are falling away. Look how low they are. The sister Sochek, Doric going low, Prosto going to be going down a half health as well. Out of range have done this perfectly. Just great trading here. There goes Persister. He drops down. Senti comes forward. He gets a finish as well. Piotr looking for Prosto. Figo out towards the back. And Kerov will be swooping around to finish off this pincer. Rusty Roster absolutely decimated in this one here. One of the, the bigger health point deficits we generally see in the WGL. And Rusty Roster on the receiving end of this great aggression here from out of range. But also tempered with a good amount of little pigs back and forth play. Prosto now. Oh, he's uh, wondering where his team went. They all dropped quite quickly, only two and a half minutes in, and he will fall in a few moments too. Yeah, he's just going to come off reload, and um, he probably will be able to do some damage, but he's, of course, a one-shot formula. We'll be able to find him. No problem at all in that SDB. That'll be the second uh, round for out of range on the board, and a super convincing one. Didn't lose a single tank. Nobody really even any uh, danger of dying there, and uh, it all just went perfectly. The exchanges were great with the FE215Bs. Desik did a great job hitting the two shells he needed to hit, and um, anyone who peeked there from Rusty Russell just got immediately shut down. You know, it's been often said that World of Tanks does resemble a war of attrition in a lot of cases because you don't one-shot each other. You know, it might take four or five shots to die, so mm. you have some health points to play with, but you also need to sort of trade back and forth, and sometimes it can be a bit of a seesaw. That really wasn't the case here at all, and, you know, we often expect to see teams trade... Uh, you know, within maybe two, 3,000 health points of each other before yeah. some sort of big fight happens here. But, but out of range had that set up really well. Now, I want to know is, did they just have the perfect formula in terms of the way that they had sort of lined up their tanks, they could watch every spot here? Or was it a, a simple case of Rusty Roster? They're just taking bad peaks and bad trades. Yeah, I mean, they did. I mean, Rusty Roster were peaking all the time. You saw at the beginning there, persisted. the team captain peaked most aggressively. Now, if that happens, I'm immediately thinking, like, what is he going to be saying to the rest of his team? You know, peak. And which they did, and they got immediately uh, taken down. And uh, I, I just looking at the lineup there from from out of range, super heavy. Okay, they had a couple of TVPs, but I mean, uh, I think with a slightly lineup from from slightly lighter lineup from Rusty Russell, they could have either said, okay, we're on the defensive side, but let's take the hill because if we don't, we're going to be in this awful situation where we're going head to head against the FE215B. And you can see there, Cormi Piotr did uh, the most damage with 2.4k. And six or seven of the top damage dealers were out of range players here as well. That says a heck of a lot. And Desert, can I just say, second highest damage there. You're hitting very, very hard. Two shots, two connections. Really can't ask for too much more there from your artillery player. And I mean, this is not a map that Rusty Ross to ever go for. They don't like this map. They have played it once before, I think. Mm. And they, uh, it was maybe even in a tiebreaker. And they lost. So it's just not one that they pick. I mean, the fact that they played it in a tiebreaker. You don't really have a choice. You have to play it then. <laughs> His poles would, of course, in the E50 just absolutely uh, getting hammered there as well. Not able to do too much at all. So, shame there, of course, for Rusty Roster here. And they're on now they're in uncharted territory, I guess. A map they're not really confident on as well. Whereas Rusty Roster has shown they have a really good setup for this one. And they know how to orchestrate themselves mid to late round as well. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if out of range just, uh, just tie this map up very easily to a nice 2-0 which I think would be a good start for them. I think Huge. they can ask for any more. I think looking at those two first rounds and Ghost Town, it was in their reach to, to win both of them. And now certainly on, on Mines. They're looking like the better team in this match and uh, they could cement it in this next round. So far, so good for 
out of range. Let's see if they can continue it here as well. I mean, as I said, any map that you can get both attack and def defense rounds is a huge boon for you. It means you're not going tit for tat round by round. It definitely allows you to get out in front and give you a bit of breathing room here. Let's see if out of range uh, are going to be offered too much of that here by Rusty Roster, who will be pushing forward as well. As you can see, a couple TVPs in the mix make that three. In fact, fairly light lineup here, actually. Object 140 and STB1 as well to round things out. Yeah, I mean, pretty light lineup, and you can see immediately Sozek's going up. That might provide some some distraction, actually. Out of range, though, cancels out, and it's just going to be an exchange at the beginning. But you barely got to fire a shot there as well. And then the rest of the tanks at the back are getting punishment as well. Doric down towards half health. True, the, the, the rest of the tanks up towards the front of Rusty Roster were looking okay, but now they're being focused down as well. These TVPs coming from out of range, putting some serious hurt down as well. Kedavan on the T10 is going to be moving up on the side here. Milos did take a bit of damage, but he loves to take that T62A on this map. It's got a nice hard head. Great for these hull down engagements. Figo pushes forward, will get the kill, but Piotr's off on the side as well. No matter where Rusty Roster go, they're being shot from two different sides. For the one will go low, the Rusty Roster are running out of gas. Look how much damage our Ranger's still putting out. Consistent, those TVPs are coming off reload. That's filthy, absolutely filthy. Just lifting his left now, and it was Rishi just go straight in towards him and give him a fitting send off. And it's a 3 1 very, very quickly. Wrap it up in a nice little bow, and out of range, have got themselves two rounds out in front with a very strong Mines performance. What we expect to see from from teams, uh, you know, when they pick their preferred map. The reality is, is that, uh, you know, if you want to be a top team, you need to be good at all maps. And exactly. unfortunately, this is uncharted territory for Rusty Roster, and they were absolutely punished. Yeah, I mean, one minute in 10, one minute in 10 second round, that was, I think, probably one of the fastest, if not the fastest uh, round we've seen this season. Just true, true obl obliteration from out of range. They went forwards. I mean, I don't know Sojek's putting up the hill for Rusty Roster. I'm not sure exactly what his aim was to do there. He just got cancelled out. Tier 8, not a massive difference, but it, it does add up. Um, and then those TVPs sit up behind the hill. You saw the peaks coming out the whole time, but out of range, fantastic positioning with the 140s. Hull down, um, just consistently getting damage. Um, the SDBs, the turret is bouncy, kind of, but uh, you can definitely penetrate it a lot more than you can penetrate a 140. And then the, the TVPs and T10s behind, just consistently shooting the back of those uh, other tanks in Rusty Roster. Yeah, really nice from every angle. So you see there as well, a very big difference between the approach on the attacking side between these two teams. First off, it was out of range, who didn't push to that middle rock in the middle of the hill. Yeah. They sat back, they had a good amount of cover, they had control of the islands on the western side of the map, and they just inched their way forward. On this case, we did see Rusty Roster just punch straight through. I mean, they went for the classic strategy of trying to put a tank up on the hill. But this is such a generic strategy that teams like out of range, apparently, will have strategy for this. They know what happens if, you know, they try and put that one tank up on the hill and then have control and shoot from the side, yada, yada, yada. When you can't even get that tank up there, when he gets disintegrated in a matter of seconds, then you're down a tank, you don't have position on the hill, and you're prone to being surrounded in that middle rock. Regardless, though, see some decent damage still coming out from Rusty Roster here as well. No, you know, main high flyers here, though. Desek now moving off the artillery, still highlighting at the top of that damage count. Yeah, I think this is the third round now where he's been in the top two, top three. So really good work by him. I mean, 320 average damage, he got 327. So he hit all of his shots, uh, penetrated them all. And that's what I was talking about he was in that hull down position just exchanging perfectly with those stbs and just uh, nailing them all and then it was you know the tvps uh, just behind um probably more towards the later part of the rounds they really started to come into their own but i mean shojek with one shot prosto with one shot Durek with three shots and really not providing any uh damage for them and you can see that was probably more of the the results and bad exchanges at the beginning of the round and no doubt about it, of course. And we have that kind of nice situation, Millie, where the team that everyone votes for, or the underdog, should I say, is actually uh, you know, performing well. And this is one of those teams that we looked at and said, yeah, really not convinced. But maybe the break has been good for them. Maybe. I mean, uh, the community, but the community is still voting with over 77% for Rusty Rasta. So, so it's increased. I'm even increased, yes. It was uh, around 80-ish a little bit earlier as well. So, um, I mean, currently it's 1-1. Uh, on the uh, viewers uh, audience side but uh, still I think there is some kind of plan maybe we'll see a comeback maybe the community knows more people tell me use the hashtag WGLU over at Twitter to tell me why the voting is so heavily favored in the non-leading team <laughs> so the vote is closed, of course. The next vote will be up in a few minutes. Yeah, do tell us, um, especially because, you know, that was 
at a Rangers pick there yeah, as well. So that's a map that they're sort of conf confident on now as well. And I mean, mm. the way the pendulum swings means that if it's a Rusty Rosses pick now. It's going to be steps for the next map and a chance for them here to maybe yeah, show us a little bit of what they're made of, of course. And you know, they wouldn't pick it if they weren't feeling somewhat confident on that particular map. And, you know, they've, they've done okay. I mean, they've, well, they've won two rounds and they've, no, they've, Actually, they haven't won, they've, they haven't they've, won a they haven't, they basically, I mean, both these teams, I can't really think of anything they've really done on steps. I think they maybe played one or two rounds each. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what they provided on this one. Yeah, no, they haven't, they haven't won. They played this twice, one attack, one defense. Yeah. So only once. Yeah. And they lost both rounds. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that goes for both teams. I, I, again, I can't think of the time they've really played this map. So, I mean, it's going to be a new uh, new uncharted territory for both of us uh, and all for you guys at home. So hopefully we get to see you know, what these two uh, can actually do. I mean, it's steps. It's always a hard one. We've seen a lot of uh, better attacking rounds than we've seen defensive rounds. Now that that whole T32 kind of strategy has um, kind of gone out the window since we're playing tier 10 now. Um, but interesting enough, I mean, looking at these uh, lineups quickly, I mean, no artillery from Dezek. Um, just medium tanks, basically, with the yeah. uh, T125. So you, you never see teams fully stack in TVPs. Both teams have two, though. A lot of STB ones and the 251 come in for both here. So the only difference, really, is out of range, bringing the 110 E5, which is probably not all that su surprising, I guess, considering that they are uh, going to be on that uh, attacking side here as well. See what they can do with it. Uh, it be Milos striving that one, but Steps it is. You guys know it. And I'm sure a few of you do love it. It is that open map with the valley over in the eastern side. And it's going to be out of range to kick things off on the attacking side here as well. Now, when you see a T1 and 10 E5, sometimes maybe you're expected to see, uh, you know, tanks use that to sort of for some hull down. And, and that uh, will, I mean, usually the defensive side goes for that one here as well. The defensive team uses that on the eastern side. Not the case this time, as it is Rusty Roster to defend. Yeah, so we're seeing a pretty aggressive start from Rusty Roster. And um, we've actually seen this in the last three or four steps rounds from every team. They just push up the north, that's the defensive team, um, RR, just going across the north, trying to head off the other attacking team from that western side because, I mean, steps, it's super risky as the attacker just to go to the right side because you're in the worst position and you can get locked down real quick. But if you do it the other way around, you push up towards the northwest, you can actually cut off the attacker um, real quick. And that's exactly what they've done here. You can see that they've already taken down Senti to 1.1k as a solid 800 damage at the start. Yeah, out of range now seem a little bit lost as to where to go from here. They were hoping that they'd be able to get up towards this area sort of um, unfettered, but it does seem like Rusty Roster read into that one well. And look at this, they actually want to go on the aggressive now as well. This is the defensive team of Rusty Roster in the red coming forward here, wanting to cut the head off of this particular snake here. Rusik up in the back there as well. He has to do with Sochek. He has got the first hit, so that is definitely going to be a boon to him if it does go to the trade between those two identical tanks. Uh, a little bit of shots coming in towards him as well from the rest of these tanks here in the valley. Now, they'll be spotted in due time, I think. Yep, there's Persist Elite. Now, what out of range move? They're going to move back towards the south. They realize now that Rusty Ross themselves have come forward. And I mean, out of range, their hand has been forced here. They have to make a move. Rusik can hold off for a little while here. He has decent cover. He can even make some free shots here. But he wants to stay alive for as long as possible. So pass passive might be the way to go here. Yeah, I mean, Riskic, he had uh, coated optics and uh, camera nets, so he stayed unspotted for a long time, and he's just, you know, spotted and, and basically kept three or four of the rusty roster tanks at bay, which is great. And if the rest of the team can work out what to do, it will give them a big advantage. Yeah, Riskic's in danger here, though, as well. Sochek's been able to get ahead in the damage race between those two tanks, so Sochek has to miss a shot here for Riskic to actually be able to get the kill. And Riskic's being harassed from the back. You can see the little lip of rock towards the front of his tank. He's able to use that to protect himself from the rest of Rusty Roster, which is really good. It's buying him a lot of time, keeping him safe for the moment, but Sochek eventually can kill him 1v1. With the next shot on a decent roll, he'll be able to finish him off here. So out of range, need to act. They need to actually capitalize off this. Good little dodge there from Rissik there, but he's going to need a little bit more after that one there. So Jack can finish him. Good roll from him. And there goes a 2 5 of out of range. Now, out of range haven't really done too much with that at all. I mean, they've sort of left Rissik to his own devices. They've moved back towards the south now. And they might even punch up the middle. I mean, for instance, they could have just pushed straight into the middle and basically come on top of uh, TVP. But they didn't, uh, onto the TV, on top of the TVPs, but they didn't. They just stayed there, waited there, and uh, seemed to have wanted to take him down that uh, RE251. Didn't really make too much sense to me. But uh, I guess they were worried, you know, how many tanks from Rusty Russell were in the back lines, how many tanks were off to the side, all those kind of things. But uh, I thought they really had them in that alleyway, 
And if you're coming from, from the top in a tactical game, you're always going to be at an advantage. So it's quite interesting now, actually, that Rusty Roster have left Sochek on his own. They've just left him for dead. Kind of the same that Ryder out of range did to Rissiak here. He will be able to do some damage and look at that nice little bait. Piotr was forced forward and he does take a, dam a hit from the TVP of Prosto. But still, both teams have traded those two five ones. They're close in health points. There's six minutes and 15 seconds left here. And out of range, haven't done a heck of a lot, really, with this attack. They're actually back where they started now. And we really have a clean sheet. They've traded RU two five ones. Senti looking a little bit low. That's maybe something to be concerned about. A couple of shots will do him in easily enough. And a line being drawn here by Rusty Roster up towards the north. They're ready for anything. Maybe hoping that out of range will try and go for some sort of cavalier strap push across the mid. But it seems like... Carmen's boys have something else in mind, maybe even a valley push here towards the east. You can see him shifting, but they're running out of time to actually, you know, make these maneuvers. At some point, they're going to have to go for the throat. I mean, they've always got to play around with that T125. Um, whatever they do, doesn't matter how fast the mediums go, they've got to wait for the T125 to get into that position first. And uh, so, I mean, this is their last play, surely. They're going to put the T110 into cap number two. As you can see, I think Rusty Roster are a little bit unsure, but they are starting to head them to that A-line because nothing was spotted by the SDBs, nothing through the middle from the TVPs. So they have correctly predicted um, that transition, but how well will they be able to adapt out of range? I mean, both teams have exactly the same amount of HP, basically, for tier 10s, and um, uh, out of range have managed to get themselves in the trench without taking too much. Um, but the problem is, of course, with that T110, they haven't managed to get into the cap, or at least haven't attempted to get into the cap. Milos has now been lit, so he wasn't even able to get over towards that cap before being spotted. He does block one shot with his armor there in towards his side. He looks like he wants to push forward here. Out of range, they kind of have to. They have to bite the bullet here. Well, Milos's case, eat them as another hit goes in towards him. He'll get towards the cap at least, but from there, that's where things could get a little bit hairy. Out of range, must set up to defend this 110E5. They may even want to push another tank on towards the cap to speed it up a little bit. But there's Milos in position on that cap. Might even be able to move up and take some shots. He's a good hull down tank here. And Polsford has to be careful about trying to challenge. Yeah, Polsford just can't challenge at all. I mean, if he does, he's going to get surprised real quick by those uh, tanks on the back line. I mean, clearly this is now on to uh, Rusty Roster to make the next move. Um, a lot of the teams, they like to come in. Well, we saw yesterday, for instance, Utopia coming in for an angle and just being super aggressive against Tornado and take them down uh, in a kind of spearhead formation. We saw Wombats, on the other hand, use a, a different tactic where they just came in from every direction onto Synergy, and it went terribly wrong. So I think with Tier 10, that kind of spearhead style, as long as you have the right exchanges and, and the right tank first, can work very well. But look how much out of range just came ahead in that exchange. Great exchange there as well. It's probably about a plus 1,000 health point advantage to out of range after trading that one in. You can look at Prosto. He's definitely looking a little bit uh, ragged at this moment, and so is Lifidus as well. He's trying to get out of that position, but he took two shots to even make that move. This is Rusty Roster losing those health points, those valuable health points that they need to challenge this cap. But Milos, he was reset for whatever reason. So that is going to be by out of range a little bit longer. In fact, that 100 seconds. So this is, uh, you know, going to put more pressure, sorry, on out of range. Bought more time for Rusty Roster here. As Milos just needs to stay safe. But it looks like out of range are unwilling to commit another tank to the cap to speed that up. No, for sure. I mean, they want Rusty Roster to come forwards. They know that they can actually get uh, the cap done in time. So what they're saying is, okay, I mean, if you're going to come forwards, we're going to win that exchange and we're going to win by uh, doing HP damage to the other team. If you just wait there, we're going to win via the cap. So, I mean, it's, that's basically how it's going to work. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, um, a little bit of fluke would uh, perhaps seal the deal for Rusty Roster. If they manage to get a reset at the last second, there's not enough time to cap, there's not enough time to kill them because the TVP is so quick. You know, these are all the kind of things that have to go through out of range's mind and you know what their next decision is. Strange moves being made here by Rusty Roster moving across towards the north there and you saw Lifidus go down to a one shot from the ensuing damage and there's Formula 1 moving in towards the cap now. He's just trying to start to apply the chokehold here to Rusty Roster and this is going to force Poles Wed forward. Three tanks on towards that cap. It's almost like out of range of realised that Rusty Roster are too far to the north to really contest this. Poles Wed goes forward, somehow is still alive after taking that one shot to reset but only six seconds left. Where's the rest of Rusty Roster? This could get very, very hairy in a few moments here. They must get the reset and they're in position. They're going to be able to get some resets. Milos taking 400 damage. Kerov pushing forward. 
forward. Rusty Ross might not have the tanks left to do this one. Now out of range, can just push forward. They're looking for Pulse Word now. They'll have him in a pinch. And it's Figo and Doric are the last two left up against six tanks. Rusty Ross, damned if they do. And you better believe they're damned if they don't here. It's Doric up against the wall. And out of range, will get the win here as well. I mean, out of range timed it perfectly. They had enough time to kill all the tanks or cap at the end of that. So even if perhaps uh, uh, Rusty Roster got one reset and then ran away, right. they would have still been able to get the cap done and dusted. So really well played by them. Nice calculated, staying cool, making the right decisions, uh, not worrying too much about the fact they lost that RU251. Playing around that T110 turret perfectly. I mean, that T110 was so crucial. Getting in the cap, staying there for long enough, baiting, and uh, not taking too much damage in the meantime. Uh, really nice stuff. And particularly those uh, those exchanges went really well. I mean, it's, it's a battle of exchanges, and every single time out of range is just coming out significantly ahead. One trend that we have observed from our newer teams to the WGL is a certain lack of resilience. You lose a tank early or something unexpected happens and some teams are simply unable to recover from the fact they can't, yep. you know, uh, maybe make changes on the fly to their strategy. What we've just seen is a very, very good example of a team that can deal with maybe some unexpected plays and either persevere with their initial strategy and make it work or adapt, go for something different and still have the instinct to uh, actually execute that one correctly. And you've got to say that out of range, we had some doubts there as we saw Milos just sort of sneaking over towards that cap point. We're thinking, well, this could get quite ugly because it's almost like a, a firing squad has been assembled here from Rusty Rosser to fire on anyone who's coming forward. But slowly but surely, bit by bit, they snuck on towards that cap here as well. Desic again, He's been an absolute beast so far, Ollie. 12 shots at uh, 3.2k damage. Really, really impressive from him as well. And in the, in the entirety of out of range, you saw those big swings in health points from those big trades, mm. all from Rusty, uh, all from out of range. And this is why. Yeah, I mean, six out of uh, seven players in that top seven. That's fantastic um, from them. And um, it just says, I mean, the whole team really pulled their weight. Everyone played well. And on a map like Steps, which is a hard map to play, let's uh, let's, let's, let's not uh, be about the bush here. It's really impressive that all six players, well, six out of seven players were on the top. So fantastic work. I mean, uh, really well executed. Rusty Roster just not providing very much. I mean, we've been talking how well uh, out of range is playing. Let's talk about how poorly, I uh, say, Rusty Roster sure. is playing. That's average, yeah. I mean, for instance, they, they, they did well at the beginning. But uh, this push through the middle could have cost them the game anyway, let's be honest here. Um, and then the kind of uh, pretty passive style they had, trying to get the resets on the cap, not going for it uh, until the very last second, and then deciding to peek and just getting punished horribly. I mean, it's not very imaginative from them. And then, for instance, you know, keeping the RU251 in that position, which is, you know, okay, you have in one TVP, which was only had one shell left in the, in the, in the chamber. It's just not good enough. They gave her that RU251, which could have made a, a big difference as well. It was a bit strange to, yeah. to leave that 251 back there as well. I mean, especially when they had the convoy of TVPs that were on site that were ready to sort of assist him, get him out get him out of there or whatever. You, you, could, you could have pulled out with the rest of them. I guess Rusty Roster prioritized that southern position so highly. And, I mean, we saw TVP go to deal with that 251, and then Rusty Roster got some free damage towards him as a result. But one shot was all that they got for that one. And then straight away, I mean, out of range, we were able to solve their problems. They said, OK, well, a bit of a weird start, but we were able to you know, wipe the board clean. We got rid of their 251. We now have the south of the map as ours again. So we have all the time in the world to make up a new strategy or yeah. adapt or change. And I mean, when you give a team like uh, out of range so much breathing room, they're going to punish you for it here as well. But Ollie, let's have a look at these tank picks now heading into what could be our last round. Yeah, super cookie cut from out of range. I mean, this is, uh, as you said, their last round. They want to be giving themselves the best chance to do into anything particularly amazing. They don't need to reinvent the wheel. So STBs, i7, RU251s, TVPs, STBs, and uh, Object 140s from Rusty Roster. And uh, Rusty Roster really haven't provided very much. They had a, a half-decent round on Ghost Town, and then from there on out on Mines, on Prokhorovka, uh, on Steps even, it's been downhill, it's been pretty bad. So I'm, I'm hoping that they can maybe put one or two more rounds on the board. But even now, I would say out of range, um, with a good boost up there for an RU251, they're playing calculated straight away. They got the STBs for the hold down play on the defensive side. They send that IS-7 all the way up the northern line, so clearly they got a good tactic here, or, or got a tactic at least. Uh, it's looking dangerous right now for Ara. I'd like to see a stat on how many rounds won by teams that actually push the 251 up there because it's a really powerful position and it almost seems like every time a team manages to be able to do that, uh, 
uninterrupted. They mm. seem to have good success. Now, out of range, they're not messing around with the valley or peeking up or anything. They're going to push as a unit here towards this five, uh, this this A5 point here. Persistent spotted Milosh, that's all. So we've seen the IS-7. Rusty Ross to know that um, their passage towards the north side is going to have a, a fair few large roadblocks, namely uh, IS, the IS-7 and Milosh, of course, and the rest of out of range, who, by the way, have snuck up here. They haven't been spotted yet at all getting here. So they've been able to boost up the 251, get back towards the north without being detected. And Rusty Roster have no idea. All they know is that there's an, there's an IS-7 at B2. Yeah, so, I mean, pushing the 251 up onto that uh, area basically covers cap number two. Having the IS-7 go forwards just to try and mitigate the fact that it's a slow tank and, and uh, the STBs will be there in, in hot pursuit pretty quickly. So they've got basically their whole tanks from north to south covering this cap number one. So they basically have both of them sorted. But of course, you know, the RU-251 has only been able to get so many resets, so many peaks if uh, Rusty Rossa do put all their forces in that uh, eastern side cap. So that's the one thing out of range has to be careful about. But they do have an IS-7. So, you know, they can go hull down. They can exchange well if, uh, if RR do go for that uh, cap number two, which it does look like they're doing. So check now will be the man at the front here, but he'll be the only man really towards that front. So he wants to try and get some information and he's seen Formula One. So he has seen that STB there. So check somehow not being punished for that at all. And the shot coming in from Risik, he could probably conject and say that that's a low caliber um, impact sound I'm hearing. So it can't be really one of the big tier tens. And Risik now just be wailing away at him. So Sochek knows he's seen him now as well. So Risik spotted. Could be a little bit tricky here as well, because like you said, that RU-251, oh, uh, sure. there it is, he's on fire as well. Absolutely stellar stuff now. And Rissik doesn't appear to have a fire extinguisher, so he takes the full brunt of that damage. No, he may have used it there, unless he had two repair kits. But still, he's crippled, and Rusty Rossa know he's there now as well. And like you said, the 251, Oliver, can't hold solo. It's not a solo defender. It's supposed to be just a auxiliary tank off towards the side doing consistent damage. But if Rusty Rossa go head first and force, I guess, Rissik to stand and deliver, it's going to be bad news for out of range. Yeah, I mean, Shotek is definitely going to go down here um, at some point in time. But I like this from, from RR. They've got Figo in the background with the TVP just stopping OR from waltzing their way straight across the middle of the map and, and getting towards that cap number two. So this is going to be tricky. You can see most of the tanks have gone up north through that A line. But I guess the big question is, will the IS-7 be able to get in position for this reset, or will anyone be able to get in the position for the reset? There seemed like a couple of resets coming in, but you can see that Risik, he went for that peak. I think he got a little bit damaged towards an STB. There's a side on STB in front of him as well, so he should be able to penetrate that one, but he's running out of time. He knows he needs to make the shot. His team depends on him to connect this one. I don't think he'll be able to do it. No, he either can't see the shot or can't connect it, and Rusty Rosta will take the round as easy as you like. I don't know what happened there. Rissig, I'm pretty sure he had line of sight towards their cap. He had a sight on STB looking at him. Why not take the shot? I don't think he had line of sight of the cap. I think there was a, a little bit too much of that crown in front of him. Right. Um, and he just simply couldn't shoot the STBs. And uh, maybe just mis miscalculated that. But I mean, that, that RU-251 armor on, on the turret is just not good enough. He yeah, would have, he would unless he got lucky, he would have gotten killed anyway. And um, he was going to be continually spotted by those STBs as well. So, I mean, putting all your faith into the RU-251 is the reason why it was up there. And I felt like Rissiette could have played the position slightly better. Maybe getting a little bit overconfident trying to kill uh, the RU-251 on Shojek. Um, which would have uh, allowed him to make that last peak a little bit more confidently, I, I would say. But um, the full commitment up north with the uh, IS-7, the STBs, I mean, that was brave for sure. But I think it was more brave that Rusty Rossa just went for hell for leather, straight into that right side, not messing about at all, um, just based on the information that Sochek had gathered. Um, there was no peaks, there was no one over there they could see. Yep. And maybe they spotted an STB on the way as well. And to be fair, Sochek stayed alive for quite some time, considering what he was essentially going forward and looking at. There was never going to be any support for him. His role wasn't to spot so that the rest of Rusty Roster could take shots. It was just to gain information. So, mm. you know, as a scout, you've always got to be having that in the back of your head. It's like a very fine line between gaining enough information and, and being too risky. You need to, you know, see what you can see. And you can see how long it lasted for, maybe three, four minutes even towards the end there as well. Gained enough information and also um, prevented out of range from gaining their own information. All they could see was the 251. They didn't really want to push forward. Yep. And again, the RU 251 being put up on the hill, there wasn't quite enough. I uh, see not a lot of damage being dealt at all in this game, Oliver. It was very much uh, a case of just go for that cap and not worry about getting your hands dirty. No one with more than 1k damage here. So it's quite a telling sign. Yeah, I mean, it was a capping game at the end of the day, which is, you know, a rarity these days. I think we see probably about one in 10 rounds 
um, actually coming away with a with a cap victory. Yep. Hardly any of them are done these days. I mean, it's not seven forty two anymore. Um, seven fifty four even. So this is this is good to see. I mean, I, I think with with the cap, it doesn't matter what map you play. You always have to have a certain level of balls to actually go for it because you're going to be in the open. You, the, the other team knows where you are. And, um, you know, you do uh, kind of uh, go against the instincts of, of a good player. I mean, a good player in World of Tanks always goes for the kills and not for the cap. And uh, I feel that mentality is you know, kind of across the board. And uh, I guess the interesting thing is some of the more interesting tactics we've seen for some, from some of these teams have been centered around the cap because I just don't think they're really wired to go for it quite yep. often. And some teams don't feel confident as well going for the fight. Either their lineup's not great, they, you know, fear the other team or maybe respect them a little bit too much. But here's your tank picks here as well and double pattern coming in plus the bat chat so for Rusty Roster so very much a different approach I feel uh, than out of range show but of course we're going to be on to Prohorovka now which I didn't really mention um, speaking of, uh, of maps where caps are ignored this is probably the best example teams don't so often really care about the capping game. They like to go head to head. They want to fight. Mm. They usually crest a hill in the middle or work straight down that western side on the road where there's a bit of cover. But one way or another, blood will be spilt. It's all about who loses less of it. Yeah, I mean, if if the attacking team does go for a cap here, it's obviously the cap number one. But what we usually see is that kind of a bait situation where a tank is put in there, which is fairly strong and um, the cap just gets worked down until the uh, defensive team has to come out of their hiding places on that right side towards the village and the A7 area and actually get the decap at some point. But yeah, double pattern, a, a very good tank. I mean, I'm really surprised how well you can actually play that one. Um, very, very, very good indeed. 390 damage, good armor, good hull down, very easy to play. I mean, not great gun qualities, but in general, very, very fun indeed. So. I think with the position which Rusty Roster put it in is perfect, in the middle, hull down, it's really where it does strive, but they are kind of playing into the hand of out of range where if they peak, those TVPs are just going to be able to unload. Say pattern again. Pattern. See, that's the biggest difference between our accents is I say pattern. What? You pattern. just pattern. 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 And f yep, the pattern. You pattern. You get rid of the N. Yeah, we, don't, we get rid of the T's, really. We don't really even say that. Oh, really? Yes. Okay, That's why it sounds so clipped. That I guess if I was speaking my Bristolian accent, I'd get rid of the T as well. Pattern. Oh, really? Pattern. Yeah. Hmm, interesting. Don't have T's in Bristolian. Do you have a Bristolian accent anymore, Ollie? No. No, you lost that one. It's I don't been know five years since I've lived there. I don't know if he's happy or not about that one. <laughs> Definitely <but> not. <laughs> Kedivar now being lit here on the 251. He actually might have a bit of trouble on his hands in a moment as Rusty Roster are actually looking to go towards this side of the map. They've clumped up in the middle. They want to cross the train line towards the eastern side. And Kedivar has been able to spot all of that out. So he's been able to give that information away. Now it's a matter of just staying the heck alive. He's going towards the river. He should be able to get out of that one safely. It looks like Rusty Roster aren't even that interested in trying to go for him. But in the in the process, look at those yellow names. Look how many Rusty Roster players have been lit. And this is where Out of Range want to capitalize on that information gain. I don't know how Persis is actually going to be able to get out of this alive. Uh, he just oh, oh. maybe provided the kind of distraction for the rest of his team to go into towards that eastern side. But they've lost one tier 10 and you've got a fantastic position from Ketavan in the background there on the right side as well. Yeah, he's in a good spot. He was uh, first the hunted. Boy, well, he's still the hunted now, I say it there. He, I, I thought he was going to get chased down a little bit there as well. He got taken out. He was still able to get a secondary spot towards these tanks. But the patterns there, you can see they're trying to use a bit of hull down over the middle of that road. Doric takes a shot. Prosto as well. Out of range, have excellent positions. And Keroff as well is able to chime in from the north. Just going to hull over on towards that train line and get some free damage across the line. And free damage, my friends, is the very best kind of damage, especially if you're out of range right now, who are dealing it in spades. Doric is low. Lifidus is super low. So these early trades, again, out of range, showing us that they've really improved in that area and they've really made Rusty Roster suffer, um, you know, in those periods before the fight really starts. Yeah, I mean, can see that Rusty Ross is trying to go forwards and maybe put pressure onto the bat chat, but that's, of course, reloading, so it's straight away oh, out God. of that position. And Rizik from the back as well, starting to punish. Yeah, he's hit, I think, at least three out of four of those shots here. So he's let his clip go. Quite a quick reload time there for the TVP, so he'll be back in, well, maybe 15 more seconds to do just that again. Th then the firing time between shots is actually what's so filthy about that tank. It's just like, you might as well just take 1,200 damage to the face and walk away, because that's exactly what is going to happen. Keroff has actually backed off that train line after Rusty Roster tried to respond by sending their own bat shot and M46 pattern there. But Keroff has got plenty of shots here. You can see the pattern can do that. He can roll over the top, he can get the hull down, and he can make the shot. Keroff not driving the kind of tank that has the gun depression to allow him to make a particular maneuver. So he actually has to commit to rolling over the top completely. But that's fine, because Rizik is, you know, putting some damage towards Polsved, out of range. Look like they're just going to now be making a bit of a push from the south. It's Rusty Roster who split themselves up there, lined themselves up here. And Figo has to try and trade 
it with Kirov here. He's got no other option. I mean, even Kirov has managed to bounce a little bit of damage, so he might be able to get this final one, and he wow. does. Fantastic one versus one. That's what you want in a match, Chad. Getting the good rolls and even blocking a shot is very, very hard to do with that armor, but he's got it done anyway. And it's crossed Owen Lifidus. And this is Rusty Ross's story coming to an end here. Not an impressive performance from them at all against a team that we really thought they'd be better than uh, in, on any map, really, from what we've seen from our general statistics. But Lifidus is a one-shot. He will drop down and out of range have done it. Getting a very striking victory here as well. I think their first win since week one yep. of this season. Oh, and, and their first win. For, I mean, their first non-tiebreaker win as well. Like, the first yes, 100%, win. you deserved it clean. And, uh, yeah, I mean, fantastic. And uh, we'll have to hope it's not just that first game after a break that is actually going to give them the victory here, if they can continue that one. And Rusty Roster, conversely, really average, even on maps of their choice. Uh, weren't able to get the two the two rounds in a row kind of thing going on, and they got I think they got a bit fortunate there towards um, steps where I think we saw a bit of a, a disarrayed out of range team there as well. But game one being done here as well, I mean, definitely not what I would have expected there as well. But we got to we got to give some accolades here to out of range as well because they're showing us a lot more than we saw from them these last five weeks. Yeah, we've been talking down about out of range for the last five weeks. It's finally to have uh, it's finally nice to have something positive to say about them. I think for for me the interesting thing is that okay, so they had that ghost town loss, but they tried something new. And it came close. They had that steps loss where they obviously had something in mind and they had something really specific trained. It didn't work out at all. They shrugged it off. They got it down on Prokhorovka, you know. And all the other th rounds they won were super convincing, very nice. I mean, a couple of player issues and you could see their Formula 1 got swapped out in the last yep. round. And uh, I think uh, Piotr was put back in again. He was, of course, one of the better players in the first couple of rounds. So, I mean, super one-sided uh, match and uh, definitely deserve out of range. Here's the damage dealt for you guys here just to finish things off. And it was Kerov in the bat chat as well. Just being an absolute pain in the neck there towards the north of that train line. Um, more, more because there was no one really set to watch that part of the map or watch him. It seemed like Rusty Roster was so focused on the central part of the map that Kerov was able to do shot after shot after shot. Mm. And you can see that. I mean, if you're getting two clips worth out of a bat chat, you have more than done your job. It's very, very good. Figo himself was able to do some damage back as well. But as we start to go down that scoreboard, you can see where some of the issues were here for Rusty Roster. Bottom three players, all from that team, all with less than 500 damage dealt. And that really does tell a lot of the story, Oli. Yeah, but sister, team captain... He was caught out in the middle. I'm not sure exactly what his plan was, but uh, I guess he saved his team some pain as uh, they did head over towards that eastern village, but he was the one who uh, copped it in the shoulder and uh, only managed to do one shot and no damage. So, yeah, I mean, that's really how the cookie's going to crumble on that match. Uh, range pick up the three points. Um, hopefully they continue this streak, maybe continue uh, with a couple more wins in the next uh, few match days. Well, Melly, we're off to a flying start here, of course, uh, on this lovely Thursday night. The next match around the corner is going to be super interesting as well. Two very tactical teams. It's going to be Synergy versus Penta. What's your exactly. take on those two? Well, the community's take, uh, at least, is 60% for Penta. And I think, well, they have to make up for some mistakes in the past, like Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. And um, I don't think that they will t take this match without a huge fight. So I think, well, that that's what the community thinks as well. And also, the community noticed that Out of Range may have learned some tactics. Dave, yep. greetings to you, buddy. Thank you for that tweet. If you want to tweet uh, tweet to us as well, use the hashtag WGLEU over at Twitter. And also follow us at WGLEU to make sure that you won't miss any single second of the results, at least, well, of our matches in form of a live ticker via Twitter. Because I will keep you updated if, even if you can't watch the stream. And also head over to our Facebook page as said, the current voting is 60% in favor for, uh, for Penta Sports versus Synergy. And the vote is still on. Get involved, get your results in. The faster, the be better, because the first three correct predictions of this matchup, of the scoreline, will receive a bonus code containing a gross tractor, as Oli knows already, and um, a little bit of gold and premium days, and of course, a, a garage slot. So get involved, I'm waiting for your votes. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to throw to a very quick break. But when we return, it's going to be Synergy versus Penta. Synergy riding high after a very strong performance against Wombats on Tanks earlier in the week. Let's see if they can carry it even further forward. We'll find out after the break. <laughs> 